Cleopatra wasn't just queen of Egypt, she was the pharaoh. She was also not Egyptian, but Greek. And that's not all that's not commonly known about Cleopatra, legendary pharaoh and living god. Today, one of the most misunderstood aspects of Cleopatra's life was that she was not fully Egyptian. As a member of the Ptolemaic family that had ruled Egypt for 300 years, Cleopatra was Macedonian like her ancestors. This meant that Cleopatra's Egyptian subjects had to not only accept the fact that their pharaoh was from a foreign family, but also be alright with the many other Macedonian and Greek people that came with the Ptolemies and ultimately filled most of the important positions within the Egyptian government as well. When she went to the library as a kid, she would have been reading about the female queens of Egypt. That would have made her aspire to be a queen. But Cleopatra and the Ptolemies, beginning with Alexander the Great, made it easier for their subjects to accept them by adopting Egyptian traditions. When Alexander seized Egypt from the Persians, he understood that Egyptians' freedom to follow their own religion and ways of life was important to them. While the Persians had taken away those freedoms, Alexander gave them back, and so was seen as a savior. Alexander's successor, Ptolemy, continued this practice by assuming all the trappings, ceremonies, and rituals of an Egyptian pharaoh. The Macedonian Greek newcomers may have ruled over Egypt, but the Egyptians were mostly free to go about their daily life without much change. According to historian Stanley M. Burstein, despite the influx of Greeks, the Egyptian way of life, legal system, and religious institutions all endured and even flourished in Ptolemaic Egypt. Cleopatra's subjects had to acknowledge her divine status as the Egyptian goddess Isis. The Ptolemies had identified with Isis for over 250 years, but Cleopatra took that role more literally than anyone before her. Cleopatra was an intellectual. She was ambitious and she was driven. She desired power above all things. To honor Cleopatra's divinity, her subjects were obligated to provide her with gifts at religious festivals, the most important of which was the annual Feast of Isis. The Egyptians believed Isis's tears filled the Nile River, a rise that was required for the flooding needed to produce the food that everyone in the kingdom relied on. So pleasing the goddess's representative on Earth was of utmost importance. In fact, the Egyptians were grateful that Cleopatra carried out the rituals and religious duties of Isis and the pharaoh. If she didn't, they believed the world would end. These ceremonial duties were often mundane and included welcoming ambassadors, appointing officials, receiving petitions, and greeting subjects. She studies the Egyptian language, and the Ptolemies before her did not see a value in learning the language. On the other hand, Cleopatra's Macedonian and Greek subjects living in Egypt had to be fine with their queen acting like Isis. But like the Egyptians, the foreign elites were free to practice their own Hellenistic traditions, so it probably didn't bother them much. Plus, Cleopatra didn't abandon her Macedonian heritage. She still oversaw the festivals and sacrifices to Greek gods that Alexander the Great had years before. In Cleopatra's Egypt, most people weren't lucky enough to be full Greek citizens and enjoy the privileges that came with it. Although there were certainly exceptions among priests and government officials, the majority of Egyptians were forced to become tenant farmers, growing food for the kingdom. Not only that, most of them had to borrow tools and even the seeds to grow crops. In fact, these farmers had so little freedom that they had to get permission to do simple things like breed pigs or even cut down a tree, according to the World History Encyclopedia. Since the royal language was no longer Egyptian, citizens had to learn Greek in order to hold any government position. But most merchants also spoke Greek, so learning the language was important in several ways. Greeks also faced some restrictions. For example, they weren't allowed to marry non-Greeks, but they benefited more often than not from living under the Ptolemies. In general, Greeks paid less taxes than Egyptians, and citizens of Greek cities like Alexandria were sometimes entirely exempt. Some Egyptians were allowed to Hellenize, the best example of this being priests, who were considered Greek for all intents and purposes. But teachers and actors also had exemptions because these were considered Greek professions. The combination of Greek and Egyptian cultures in Ptolemaic Egypt created circumstances that were unique to women in the ancient world. In the more progressive Egyptian culture, women were legally independent and could own property, and wives were allowed to do their husband's work if they weren't able to. Women could choose who they married, they chose who they divorced, they could start businesses, they kept their own property. On the other hand, it was the complete opposite for Greek women. In most of the Greek world, women had no rights, and a queen ruling over a kingdom on her own like Cleopatra did was completely unheard of. This hybrid of cultures created an interesting scenario where Egyptian women in small villages had more rights and independence than Greek women, even though they were considered lower class. However, since the Ptolemies had ruled Egypt for three centuries by Cleopatra's time, both cultures influenced each other, 
which meant Egyptian women's rights became more limited over time. Yet for Greek women, the change was positive, as wives were more relied upon by their husbands than anywhere else in the Greek world. Egyptian farmers had to live under strict rules from the pharaoh. Villages throughout Egypt were told by the government what crops they should plant, and farmers were actually forbidden to leave these villages during harvest seasons. But none of these restrictions compared to the heavy taxes and forced labor many subjects had to endure. Most Egyptians not only had to pay taxes on their land, the food they grew, and the goods they made, but they were even taxed for their children and slaves. According to historian Donald L. Wasson, there was a salt tax, a dike tax, a pasture tax, and fishermen even had to give the government 25% of what they caught. It gets worse than just taxes. Cleopatra also had the power to summon her subjects whenever she needed workers to farm and harvest crops, which could happen more than once a year. Mandatory labor was also required to maintain the many canals the Ptolemies had constructed in the 3rd century BC in order to grow even more crops. For centuries before the Ptolemies came to power, Egyptian life had been focused primarily on the Nile. But the Ptolemies built Alexandria, their new capital city, on the Mediterranean coast so they could more easily trade with other Greek kingdoms. This shift to focus on the Greek world caused many Egyptian farmers to change the types of crops they grew and goods they made. Egyptians were free to stick with their traditional goods, and many certainly did so, but the products Greeks favored were more lucrative, like wine, olive oil, and wool. And the government used incentives to encourage Egyptian landowners to produce these products, such as lower taxes for those who started vineyards with their own money. To entice farmers to grow the dorum wheat preferred by Greeks over the barley and emmer wheat traditionally grown in Egypt, the Ptolemies invested a massive system of canals, since the dorum required much more water. Egyptians were then often forced to maintain these canals with mandatory labor. Along with drinking wine, using olive oil, and speaking Greek, the reign of the Ptolemies and Cleopatra normalized other Greek practices. The most substantial of these was the creation of the kingdom's first currency. Prior to the Greeks' arrival, Egyptians still traded goods through a barter system, with wheat as the item most exchanged between people. Ptolemy I changed this when he minted the first widespread Egyptian currency. Then, in the early 3rd century BC, the use of all foreign coins became outlawed, even ones from other Greek kingdoms. So if merchants only had foreign coins and wanted to buy goods in Egypt, they had to exchange these for Egyptian coins at a one-to-one -one ratio, even if the Egyptian ones were worth less. Another new idea introduced to the Egyptians by the Greeks was the state auction, which was widespread by Cleopatra's day. However, in his book, The Last Pharaohs, J.G. Manning writes that a batch of ancient papyri discovered in 1906, known as the Milan Archive, showed how this foreign idea could be used against the priests, the most powerful Egyptians. When these priests were behind on their tax payments, the official, who was named Milan, was ordered to auction off their property to pay what was owed. With inflation rising throughout Egypt, Cleopatra created two new coins that her subjects were strongly encouraged to use in place of the previous currency. Before she left her kingdom to visit Rome in 46 BC, the pharaoh decreased the amount of silver in her coins by 40% and minted brand new bronze coins, according to Dwayne W. Roller's book, Cleopatra. Also, Cleopatra didn't issue any new gold coins, so her subjects stopped using the more valuable currency. Gold coins disappeared entirely throughout Egypt during her reign. The most revolutionary change the pharaoh brought to the Egyptians was the introduction of different monetary denominations. Previously, only the weight and the type of metal determined the value of a coin. Now, Cleopatra's subjects had to look at the markings on a coin to figure out how much they were worth. Cleopatra already had extraordinary power over the Egyptians, but her control over the lives of her people increased even further when severe droughts devastated the kingdom. Droughts first caused widespread famine right after Cleopatra became pharaoh in 50 BC. Cleopatra knew she was vulnerable as a new queen, so getting the Greeks of Alexandria on her side was more important than anything else. Unfortunately, this meant that she had to throw her Egyptian subjects under the chariot. Cleopatra forced merchants to send the grain from southern Egypt to Alexandria. If any subject disobeyed, she threatened them with death. But seven years later, when the dangerously low Nile River again caused a famine, Cleopatra didn't abandon her Egyptian subjects. Food was stockpiled in royal storehouses and distributed to people in need. The pharaoh also cracked down hard on corrupt officials and made sure no one in her government took advantage of the people during that difficult time. Another added bonus was that the Egyptian merchants were forbidden to sell food supplies to the Romans who'd murdered Julius Caesar, Brutus, and Cassus. Cleopatra told the Romans that the kingdom didn't have enough resources, but even if that was true, it's highly doubtful the pharaoh would have helped the men who killed her lover. When Cleopatra wanted a rival executed, her subjects were ordered to commit the murder without hesitation, even when the victim was a member of her own family. 
According to the ancient historians Cassius Dio and Eusebius, the pharaoh not only had the king of Armenia killed, but also her own brother, Ptolemy XIV, who posed a major threat to her reign. Supposedly, the pharaoh had her men do the deed with poison. It must die. The Armenian king, although not nearly as much of a threat, meant a much more brutal end. For betraying her lover Mark Antony, Cleopatra imprisoned the rival king only to have him executed three years later. Afterwards, the pharaoh ordered his head delivered to the Median king. Since the two kings were enemies, Cleopatra hoped the gruesome gift would convince the Median king to ally with her, but he rejected her offer. Arguably, the worst insult the Egyptians had to endure during Cleopatra's reign was being ruled by a family from a foreign land who in turn had to obey the Romans. But the pharaoh's alliances with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony were necessary at a time when the Romans dominated all of the Mediterranean except for Egypt. If Cleopatra and her subjects wanted to avoid conquest as well, they had to please the generals of the growing empire. Even worse for the Egyptians was that all of Cleopatra's children were fathered by the two Roman generals, meaning that her heirs would be Roman. Ptolemy Caesar. What? You can't call him that. Not without Caesar's permission. I'll name him whatever I choose. The Romans were there to stay, and the Egyptians just had to deal with it. For the most part, this simply meant that the Egyptians had to provide housing and food for thousands of soldiers stationed in the kingdom, along with shipping grain to Italy or wherever the Romans needed it. Of course, Roman control became absolute after Cleopatra and Mark Antony were defeated. Egypt then became a Roman province and had to live by their rules from then on. 